All right. Well, thank you guys for having me today. Um, this has actually been a tough talk for me to develop because as many of you know, adversity can come in many forms. And as an adult, we get to experience adversity in different forms. And I'm having a life full of adversity right now. I used to think that when I grew up in foster care, uh, I was waiting for that moment that I turned 18 because I thought that at age 18, the world would fix itself and life would get easier. What we learned, or what I learned, is that life does not get easier. We get stronger or we don't. And I'm here to talk a little bit about when people do get stronger. To understand me, you need to understand my background of where I come from, my culture, my history, my adversity. Growing up, I experienced 10 out of 10 aces. And here are all of the ACEs listed. So multiple types of abuse, neglect, mental illness, uh, violence in my home, drugs, you name it, that was my life when I was growing up. Now all of my ACEs occurred when I was in, the, uh, in my biological family. A lot of my ACEs occurred in foster care because I was exposed to it for a very long period of time. All of this, as we talked before, is quite a toxic combination on a, on a developing person's brain as they grow up. So research indicates that the tipping point for adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, is actually four. And I've experienced a 10 out of 10. So when you're looking at the chart, we saw this a little bit earlier, when you're looking at the chart, the more the ACEs you have starting at four, the more likely you are to have disease, mental illness, and even the possibility of an early death. So I entered, the age, I entered foster care at the age of six. I was not your normal six-year-old. At six, I could take care of my four-year-old brother, food, feed him, clothe him, and protect him. Life was a challenge, but I had no idea that I was being abused or neglected. This was home, this was my life, and that was my family that I was removed from. I saw mo more in my home than most people would see in a lifetime on television. I entered foster care, excuse me, my notes are dinged, I entered foster care um, with my biological brother, and we were together in foster care for a couple years, but what ended up happening was with, in foster care, we got split up. He ended up going to the California foster care system, I ended up staying in the Montana foster care system. I can remember everything about the moment that I was taken away. I can remember the police raid on our trailer. I can remember my footy pajamas, the feel of my feet along the ground as I walked to the police car. And I can remember my mother being placed over another police car and being handcuffed as she got smaller as the car pulled away. So I remember this age, and I remember what it was like to be a child. And I don't remember everything. This used to be one of my favorite photos because I don't have a lot of photos from when I grew up in foster care or from my biological family. But as an adult, I've learned to look at this photo a heck of a lot differently. And when you look at this photo, I know that sometimes kids fall and uh, hurt themselves and have accidents and are cut and banged. But if you look closely at my little brother there, he's the smaller of the two of us, there's a lot of marks on him that probably should not be there. And that doesn't look like one accident and one fall down. Then if you look at me, I have a little bit on me, but not much. But if you look at my teeth, I had a full set of metal teeth because my parents claimed that I fell off of a picnic table. But I don't remember that. I have no clue what happened. And you would remember the dentist for the amount of work that had to go into that mouth. I have no clue what that was. But what I was told is that sometimes we protect ourselves. And our brains have a very, very powerful ability to keep us from remembering things for very good reasons. I don't remember the picnic table. I don't remember the dentist. Uh, I was diagnosed with PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder as I was growing up in the foster care system. And I'm not sure if I got that from my childhood or if I got that from actual foster care. Either way, it's a diagnosis. So you can have flashbacks randomly. I've had very few of those. But my biggest issue is that I have memory gaps in my childhood. And did you guys know that foster children suffer a rate of PTSD that rivals the rate of that of war veterans? And if you think about that, what happens in war? There's a lot of violence, blood, and scary stuff that happens. And our children are experiencing this, not only in their biological families, but some of us are very unfortunate and experience it when we're meant to be protected. Treatment from my biological family created adverse reactions for me growing up in the foster care system. It created an ability for me to not, an inability for me to not attach to people, to not trust people, especially female uh, people because of my mother issues that I had growing up. Um, 
I hid behind a mask. When you're taking care of your younger brother, that was my life. I didn't want anybody to see the weakness behind my eyes, and I didn't want them to know that I had vulnerabilities because I had to care for my younger brother, and I had a very specific life that I was living at that time. My brother and I were separated in Karen. I, I said before, two different backgrounds, California versus the Montana foster care system. We both have adverse childhood experiences. We both have probably a 10 out of 10. I've never asked him. Um, and I was able to meet, not meet him, talk to my brother after I turned 18. We are two very, very different people. And I'm not going to tell you a lot about his history or his future, but I can tell you he is not the person you see standing for, before you today. So a temporary safe haven known as foster care turned into a long-term permanent solution for my life. I was promised a home, a long-term single home, and instead they provided me with 11 foster homes, two group homes, two children's homes, and 50 different respite providers. And for those of you guys that don't know what a respite provider is, they're good and they're bad depending on the view that you're looking at, but a respite provider can provide relief for the foster family and for the foster youth from that home temporarily but they're not really intended to provide relief during holidays, birthdays, vacations, that type of stuff. In care, I experienced even more trauma than I experienced from my biological family. I had multiple religions forced on me. And remember, in this country, religion is a freedom that we all have. Uh, my foster siblings did crazy things, such as pooing under my mattress, putting glass in my pillows, and beating me with a padlock on their hand when I came home from school because they got in trouble for something that I didn't have anything to do with. That was a life that I grew up in. And again, at the time when I grew up in the system, it was really crappy, but I didn't identify it as any more trauma. It was just my life that continued to get worse and worse. Excuse me, my notes are getting mixed up because I'm getting nervous. <laughs> And that happens when you talk about yourself, you get nervous. So home, wherever that was for me, was crazy and it was chaotic. I feared home. Would I have to hide in my room? Would I get fed? Or far worse, would I be a person on the outside looking in of, uh, at the life? Would I have to watch my foster family having family time with their biological kids while I was outside doing chores or in the kitchen cleaning the dishes while they got to play board games? Or even worse, would I be sent away for a family vacation when that was supposed to be what is called a family time? I longed to be part of a family. Without a family of my own, I had to turn to the only thing that enabled me to survive. And I was fortunate enough to choose education and school as my survival technique, while people all around me were choosing many different routes that you could have taken to survive and to get attention that they needed. I moved every one to two times per year, and on average in my time in foster care. I attended three high schools, and I lost semesters of work because suddenly, mid-finals or mid-midterms, you'd be pulled and moved to a new location without any warning. So there were periods where I, where I would have to take multiple Englishes, multiple maths, multiple sciences, just to get back up with my peers. I lost count of how many times I heard, you'll stay here just until we can figure out what to do with you. What to do with me? I mean, you don't tell a kid that. What does that mean? What to do with you? Um, I felt like a burden. I felt ungrounded and unattached. It was a wonder that I actually was able to focus on school. But again, I'm glad that I chose education as my survival technique, where the people around me, including my foster homes, sometimes teachers, were telling me that I was never meant to be anything more than the bloodline that I had just come from or from the family that I came from. I was driven to prove them wrong, and school was also something that you could dump yourself into. My only impression of life at the age of six was that, well, six on, was that I moved a lot and I had very little possessions, only enough that could usually fit in a plastic garbage bag. And I want to ask you guys, when you guys go on family vacations or make a move, do you use one plastic garbage can or, or garbage bags or a couple to move, or do you actually put it in a bag and make a move and go on vacation? Plastic bags I do not recommend if you're trying to help a, a youth overcome some obstacles. Life was rough, and my experiences in the Montana foster care system will ever change my life. I used to not tell people that I was in foster care because I was embarrassed of the stigma behind it. Often people would say, uh-oh, what did you do to get placed in foster care? That is crazy. Youth do not do things to get placed in care. Stuff happens to them to get placed in foster care. So what they didn't realize is that they thought I did a world of wrong to end up in foster care. And what they don't realize is that a world of wrong was done to me. And that stigma is something that foster youth today fight to overcome because they don't realize that there is a separation between foster care and the juvenile justice system. They're two different systems, although many of us overlap into those systems. 
I eventually learned to overcome my stigma. And I know that I just shared a lot about my adversity, but in order to understand my success, you have to understand my adversity. So my life hasn't been all pure adversity. I learned how, how to overcome it. When I aged out of foster care, the day that I aged out of foster care was actually the day that I graduated from high school. Um, during high school, um, excuse me, I was selected to interview for the independent record. And for those of you guys that are local, you know that every year they do a highlight of all of their seniors with little pictures and a snapshot and a bio. Well, I was selected um, to be one of those students. And Helena High School was the third high school that I attended and my final high school, and I love that school. Um, and well, I went, I met with the reporters of the independent record, and it was a unique experience. This was the first time that anybody wanted to hear about me without me trying to get their attention. Um, and it was interesting. She seemed to honestly care about who I was, where I came from, and where I was going. And she had no idea who I was. She was just doing her job. Well, like most students, or most high school students, I don't read the, I did not read the newspaper. I also did not have a, a you know, access to a newspaper on a regular basis because that's not something that I wanted. But on Monday, when I got to school, the article had run in the newspaper and I was expecting just to be highlighted with a whole bunch of other little people. Um, what ends up happening is that I end up being displayed um, full page, centerfold, all alone, no other students that are displayed. And when I get there, Monday at school, everyone is being very, very weird towards me. And I had not seen this article yet. They had big smiles, they were proud of me, they were happy. And then for someone whose survival technique is education, can you imagine being called to the principal's office? That was my lifelong goal. Do not send me to the principal's office the week of graduation. Seriously. Well, the principal also had a large grin on his face. And he complimented me when he walked in, and I hadn't seen this article. And he says, Helena High is proud to have you as a student, and we're proud of your accomplishments, and we hope that you have a great future ahead of you. And hands me a huge backpack stuffed with cards from the community that had arrived over the weekend. I have no idea how they got to the school. And he handed me this article. And I expected to open it up and see many students, and there I am, right in the middle of it. This was the first time I realized that people were watching me and that our lives matter and that I was part of a community. But it didn't stop there. Oh, excuse me. So, oh, I stuttered, sorry. So this was the first time I received attention without actually searching for it or getting the wrong kind. Graduation was hard in 2002. That year we lost six people, six high school seniors to death suicide and illness, it was a very crazy year. And one of those students was a very close friend of mine. So on graduation day, I, uh, I had a couple people close to me attend, but I wasn't ready for what was about to happen. So as usual with the graduation, you rock, walk across the stage and people call your name and your family or your friends cheer for you. And sometimes more people cheer for you. Well, they were calling names and as they called the, the names of the, the people who died, there was extra cheer and extra sadness that went through. But when they called my name, I almost, I pretty much froze because the entire stadium started cheering for me. It was, it's just hard to explain what that was. It was one of those moments where I was breathless, I was speechless, and those of you that know me, I talk a lot, so that doesn't happen very often. Um, but it's when I truly realized what it meant to be part of a community and the power that the community had for me. This was the moment that I realized that adversity is not destiny, but I also realized that destiny is to have adversity, and it's how you deal with it that matters. Not all of us are as fortunate to figure this out. Life after foster care did not get easier, but I continued to grow stronger. I somehow got to college, and I, after some time off, I was required to take an internship for part of my degree, and little did I know that that internship was gonna be part of my destiny as well. So I interned with a program called Foster Club. And what this program does, it's the national network for youth in foster care, and I was the first generation of their interns. Now there are hundreds of these interns scattered across the United States. It taught me that all of my emotions, my angers, my fears, the stigma that I had been dealing with could be channeled to empower others and to change the lives of my foster brothers and sisters currently within the system. It is 10 years later, and today I now serve on Foster Club's board of directors. I'm still actively involved, as well as other organizations that are working to improve the lives of youth in foster care. The internship taught me how to value my own life, 
which provided me the ability to value other people's lives. One concept that I was taught in foster care was about permanent, or excuse me, in my internship was about permanency. And permanency means many different things depending on the field or the arena that you work in. But for me, permanency is that lifelong connection to one kind, caring adult that will not pass judgment on you no matter what happens. Your good decisions, your bad decisions, they're there to watch you rise and to watch you fall. Well, ever since sixth grade, and I think it was out of order, so I'm going backwards now. Uh, but ever since sixth grade, I had stayed in touch with my sixth grade music teacher. And by the way, this is his sixth grade music teacher photo from when I was that grade. So I don't know if he likes it or not, but that's OK. Um, but he was my sixth grade music teacher. And he got me involved with theater and local community activities and singing and doing everything he can to keep me out of that a bad situation that I was already in. I was already in foster care. What the heck could he do to make it any better? He got me actively involved with the community. Because of my internship, though, I realized that I had permanency. And up until this point, I had never identified myself or Mr. John Baber from Billings as my permanent connection. I thought that I was all alone and that the world required that we go it alone. But Foster Club and my internship allowed me to overcome that. And at the age of 25, I was adopted as John Baber's son. Thank you. <laughs> So he brags, he's hungry for time, he gets really annoyed when I don't call him on a regular basis or when I don't check his emails, and he finally learned how to send a text message. <laughs> if only he could learn how to read them too. Um, so this is a glimpse into my life, but somehow this nowhere near scratches the depth of my adversity. So this is just a glimpse into my life. 11 years in foster care is a long time, a lot of homes, a lot of families, a lot of adversity. I want you to remember something from my life, and this is how I overcame it, besides my one lifelong connection. One, you have to be taught to hate and fear. So teach love, compassion, and understanding. Three, look through other people's eyes, or walk a mile in their shoes. Not everybody is as fortunate as you to have the life that you lived, and not everybody had as hard of a life as you did and you had to live. Three, be a rock to your community. Show courage under fire, teach courage, and encourage those that need it. Do not tolerate bullying. Bullying is part of the adversity cycle. They're just passing it on from their lives. Don't tolerate it and teach them how to overcome it. Finally, I may never have children, but I hope that you guys will join, join me in the same cause, is that we need to fight for the protection of our children today to ensure the futures of generations to come. And that means we have to do everything in our power to reduce the number of adverse childhood experiences that our children are experiencing today so that they don't pass on the cycle. And something, my favorite quote, is that it takes a village to raise a child, and I want you guys to remember that. Thank you.